Hello everybody and welcome to another weekly update video from me, Martin. I'm an Inkscape de developer uh, hoping to develop features and fixes for everyday Inkscape users. Uh, thank you for joining me on this very busy week. Uh, we're going to get started by first of all thank thanking all of my supporters. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, we're just going to kick straight into what I have to present. So. This week, what I wanted to do is something a bit different. Uh, this week, I was involved in doing some refactoring work on Inkscape to fix a bunch of crashes and things that were happening. And I did it by changing a bunch of code all at once in order to clean Inkscape up so it's more maintainable and more consistent. And rather than just say that, I figured that I would actually walk you through. And what we'll do is something called a code review. This is where a programmer will look at code and think about what problem problems it's trying to solve and if the code quality is improved. So let's have a look. Okay, so the first thing is, is that this code is responsible for changing tools. On the left bar, every time you change a tool, this code is run. And what you can see here is a bunch of red lines and a bunch of green lines. The red lines are the lines that I have removed in this particular merge. The green lines are the lines that I have added. Uh, each of the lines is an instruction that the program is running, so they run sequentially one after another, just in case you're uh, not a programmer yourself. And uh, what you can see is, is this is the core of the change. But you can also see at the top here, this change involves removing two and a half thousand lines and adding almost 2,000 lines. And this is what happens sometimes when you do refactoring. You start off with a core fix, and that core fix requires changes that cascade and ripple through the entire so software package. And for a project as big as Inkscape, it can actually be quite substantial to fix small problems and create huge amounts of work. Um, it's a bit like that trick with the uh, tablecloth, where you have to pull the ta tablecloth and all of the things that are on the table have to stay still. Uh, that's very much what happens with refactoring. You have to pull a whole bunch of code and hope absolutely nothing apparent has changed. Um, so let's walk through what this change is and what it means. So what, what's happening here is that when you select a new tool, it first of all, it deletes the previous tool and then it creates a new tool, right? Um, you may think that you're actually switching tools, but what's actually happening internally is that it's destroying the tool and then it's making a new tool. Uh, and what it was doing is it had these special functions for finishing and for setup. And these were called, finish was called before the actual the delete. And then uh, setup was called after the actual construction. Now the problem is, is that uh, the the desktop ob object and the tool object are kind of meshed together. A desktop is not valid without a tool, and a tool is not valid without a desktop. But this code has tool creation, which is this line here, with no desktop at all. The next line actually sets a desktop, and the actual setup for the tool doesn't happen until the fifth line. What this means is that Typically, computers are fast enough that it would just execute those lines very quickly, no problem. But there's an opportunity there to have inconsistency. The assumption is, is that the desktop exists. But as you can see, that's, that assumption is not necessarily true. And if you create code that, had, that uses assumptions but doesn't knit those assumptions into the actual code fabric itself, what you end up doing instead is creating an opportunity where a crash can happen in between those two executions. So maybe the set desktop calls something that relies upon the setup. Uh, maybe the message context, which is all about setting the uh, status bar, requires the setup. Uh, or maybe something else happens, like an event that happens in a different thread, um, you know, leaps in and says, hey, do I have a tool? Can I set the desktop? And the desktop isn't set yet. Um, these are all bad no-nos. Um, now, for the programmers out, out there, yes, I am aware that this particular code doesn't fix one of the particular issues, which is using ref pointers. This is C++. It should be using ref point and pointers, uh, baby steps, 
<laughs> bit by bit, this code is evolving. Um, so what I had to do is I had to basically take all of these steps that you see that are outside of the tool creation, and I had to ingest them into the actual constructor itself. So the actual new code, these green, green lines that you see, is a single line. This line creates a tool. And then the tool creation itself is responsible for making itself consistent. Now, because of the way the rules of constructors and destructors work, they have special requirements that mean that I had to refactor a bunch of other things that are to do with strings and virtual functions and things that it was calling that you're not allowed to do because um, the object isn't ready yet right? In, in the constructor. It's not done. Now, it's also true that uh, in the destructor, the finish function goes away uh, for the same reason. We don't want a situation where like just between the two, it's, you know, it's got a finished tool that's not actually deleted yet. Um, this destructs itself in the same way, right? Internally. Now, James, the intern actually caught an, a bug that was caused by this destructor. Um, other parts of the code assumed things and were actually trying to destroy tools without calling the finish. And so when I made the destructor actually do all of the finish code, that destructor call, called code that it did not expect to have run. And now we have inconsistencies. So he actually fixed that bug. So it's a good save from, from James. Um, I won't actually show you all the other 2,000 lines of code because I don't think it's too important. Um, you can have a look at the merge if you're particularly interested. Um, but I thought it would be uh, instructive for people to understand some of the work that, that I do here on Inkscape and understand that uh, even if nothing appears to change, um, we're trying our best to kind of make Inkscape a more maintainable and more... Um, vibrant project by just improving the code consistency, improving the code quality over time. Um, and that's about it. If you have any questions about this particular thing, I'm super interested to answer them. Uh, but you're probably an artist yourself. This is just a curiosity. Um, so thank you very much for indulging me on this particular uh, adventure. And uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to move on just save this. And in other Inkscape news, uh, we have a very busy week. So first of all, Inkscape 1.1.2 point release comes out. It has a whole bunch of crash fixes, a whole bunch of things happening. That comes out today, later today, depending upon when this video gets posted. The alpha for 1.2 is coming out. It, I think it's coming out today, but it might be next week. That is because of some of the ch changes that I'm about to mention. Um, so Javier has, he's been doing more live path, live path effects work and he's actually added an LPE copy effect, which has all of these super interesting, like flipping and rotating uh, patterns that you can do with a, you know, with a repeating pattern. It's great for wallpapers, great for like repeating uh, mandalas and stuff like that. Um, I super checked that out because it is so interesting. Um, Adam Bellis, who is actually a designer, he's actually changed the, the default preferences in Inkscape so that in Inkscape 1.2, 1, 1 the default theme, uh, default snapping, default, uh, a bunch of other de defaults have actually been modified. A lot of pro programmers are actually very um, cautious about changing the, the defaults because we don't want to change how Inkscape works version to version. But uh, for a designer and a UX per person, Adam is more uh, well positioned to make a decision about like what the best thing to deliver in Inkscape is. Uh, Mykov, uh, he has been doing the, um, he's been fixing a bunch of things actually, uh, snapping flow boxes in mar 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 marker combos, uh, lots of other crash f fixes and stuff. Um, new entrant Jonathan uh, Newhouse. He, he's actually been doing the, uh, ex the extensions for, for a couple of weeks now, so make, making sure that they're ready for 1.1.2, making sure that they're ready for 1.2. Tons of work, great guy, uh, really taking uh, control and, and responsibility over making sure that the uh, extensions work is delivering. Um, all great stuff. Um, Mark, he has... So the main thing that Mark has actually merged in this week has been dithering. So if you create a gradient in Inkscape, typically what the gradient will have is banding, and this is because of SRGB 
constraints in colors. One of the ways around the band banding ingredients is to use a thing called dithering. And Mark has added this feature into Cairo, which is a library that Inkscape depends on to do drawing. Uh, Nathan Lee, who, as you know, is our, is our resident bug expert, he's been fixing freezes. He's been fixing, uh, he's been back porting an awful lot of stuff for 1.1.2. Um, Tav this week has been finishing off some, some of his actions work by making sure that extensions can actually be called from the command line again. Now, the final mention is that we have a new contributor called PBS. Um, he's a he's a white knight that uh, rode in from the dark, from seemingly nowhere, to um, tackle one of the most intransigent Inkscape pro problems, which is speed. Speed of the graphical user interface, speed of rendering. Um, he's been investigating, and not just investigating, but providing the most detailed and comprehensive descriptions about what is wrong, how he's processing, how he's investigating the problem, looking in different pro projects for solutions, like all sorts of great stuff. He has a merge, which has just gone through for improving the uh, speed of the cam canvas re rendering. It um, ha still has problems. This is one. This is the reason why I mentioned before, which is why I don't know whether the alpha is going to be released today. It's simply because this particular merge is incredibly unstable. Um, so we, we're, we're all trying to support PBS's work as much as possible, um, providing him with test stuff, providing them with um, information about how the Inkscape project works, because he's still new to the project, um, but with hope. Uh, we're looking at speed improvements on Mac OS specifically, speed improvements on win Windows, and speed improvements on Linux as well. Um, all great things. I mean, even even investigations into putting Inkscape's rendering into the GPU. And uh, that about wraps it up for this week. Um, thank you for joining me, and I hope to see you all next week.